see you virtually on Saturday. What's that? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I was there for two hours and was grateful to leave. I enjoyed the two hours I was there, and that was more than enough. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't sit all day. Yeah. You do my favorite little list, take cardboard and cut out and just put it in front of it. Yeah. Yeah, I thought about it. Uh, yeah, but we don't have interact too much. Mm-mm. No, I, well, I was having the thought as I was watching the class, I was thinking, they really need to do what we do for this class. Mm-hmm. Here's the information. Right. We'll meet together on Saturday and we'll discuss it for an hour. Yeah. Okay. Not, I'm going to lecture to you for five hours via Zoom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's just painful. Yeah. Just painful. Very painful. Right. Um, yeah. A little, little too much. Um, all right. Well, we are in Second Kings. So before we get started, let me uh, open this rule of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight. Uh, thank you just for the, the opportunity that we have to be here uh, to study your word. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would be with us now as we take a look at Second Kings. Pray that you would help us to understand, to comprehend, and uh, to figure out uh, how it is that you would have us apply to our lives. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so Second Kings is a... Um, it's a fascinating book in terms of it's not being fascinating. Uh, you know, I, I recorded the lecture for Second Kings, and then as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, it's 25 minutes. <laughs> There's got to be something else I can say about Second Kings. And I couldn't come up with much. Uh, you know, the whole goal of the lectures is just to give three, you know, not... Sunday school broad, but fairly broad perspective, kind of high, touch some of the high points of theology and, and, uh, and hit some of the important parts, but yeah, there's not a whole lot <laughs> to pull out in Second Kings, uh, which in some ways is uh, kind of raises the question of well, why does this book even exist? It almost seems like, well, we're, this is just a means to an end. We got to get to the end of the story, so we got to read the end. You know, kind of like when your teacher assigns you a book and you lost interest after about eight chapters and you have another chapter to go. I got to read the last chapter because I got to be able to say I read the whole book, but I'm not really interested. Kings feels that way at times. There are some fascinating parts, but as the book goes on, especially when you get to the decline of the kingdom of Samaria, you just kind of wish it was over. There's not a whole lot going on of... of uh, you know, it's, it's who killed who, or who did a coup against who, or who uh, who got in a fight with who. I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't really seem like all that much significant information. Uh, you know, I mean, for instance, I could probably give you, just off the top of my head, a rough outline of the kings of Judah. I stopped caring after, like, Jeroboam II, I just stopped caring about northern, the Northern Kingdom. So I could probably give you some names, but I couldn't, I couldn't spell out who the significant kings are in the North by the end, because who cares? You know, I mean, none of them last more than a few months, you know, a couple of them last a couple of years. But, you know, at that point, it's just like, yeah, so you're the guy who killed the guy who's going to get killed by the guy who's then going to get killed by the other guy. At that point, it's just like, who, who cares? Uh, the, the good part of it, though, in a sense, is that in First Kings, we had it starting with Judah, and by the end of the book, we're focused on Israel, the northern kingdom, Samaria, and it's all about Ahab and Elisha. As the book opens, we're still dealing with Elijah, excuse me, Elijah and Ahab. As the book opens in Second Kings, we're dealing with Elisha and his interaction with the northern kingdom, and yet the northern kingdom's going to cease to exist. And we're going to go off into only talking about the southern kingdom. So in some ways, we've almost got what looks like a chiasm in some ways. Um, the first half of first kings is Judah, because it's all there is. Uh, you know, the, all of Israel's united. And then the second half of second kings is only Judah, because that's all there is. And then in the middle section, the end of first kings and the beginning of second kings, we've got a lot other information on Israel. But 
the, the greater focus at the beginning of 1 Kings is on Solomon and, uh, and the temple. The second half is really focused on Josiah and the temple and Hezekiah and to some degree the temple, but more on the city of Jerusalem. That's more the focus of the, of the second half of 2 Kings. You got all this focus on, on Israel in the middle with little bits of Judah thrown in here and there. Uh, there's still uh, Jehoshaphat's mentioned quite a bit. Uh, he probably gets the most focus of Ju uh, Judah kings or Judean kings in the end of second or first kings and the beginning of second kings. But to some degree, you almost get the sense that he's only getting mentioned because of his interaction with all the kings of Israel. So it's almost as though that's the main focus there. But then you get to the point where I don't even care about Israel anymore, northern Israel, because it's just the wild, wild west, and people are killing people, and the Assyrians are coming in, and, and you know, then the, the, the focus has shifted to now we're dealing, we're dealing with the, the southern kingdom only, and then once, once Israel's gone, and Samaria's been taken off into captivity, then we're definitely only dealing with, uh, with, the, with the southern kingdom. Uh, so it, that makes it a, an interesting book on the one hand, because now we get back to talking about Judah, and we've got some pretty big stories there with Josiah and Hezekiah. But until we get to that point, it just feels tedious. You know, here we've got this, <laughs> these books called Kings, and we focused on Kings, but we spent a lot of time talking about Elijah and Elisha, right in the middle of Kings. It's not, the book's not called Prophets, the book is called Kings. You know, the Septuagint names it, it's called 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Kings. And yet we almost feel like we're dealing with Samuel, back at the beginning of 1st Samuel, where there is no king, the focus is on the prophet. Same thing here, we're talking about all the miraculous stuff that Elijah and Elisha did that solidifies them as prophets of God which seems a little odd because there's not a whole lot of focus on a king as much as there is on, on the prophet until we get back to the interaction between Elisha and whatever king happens to be in, uh, in northern Israel at the time. Uh, and then once Elisha is dead, there's nobody else. There's, there's not another prophet that comes along. Once Elisha is dead, the prophets that are going to be in focus for the rest of Israel's history really start with Hosea and go on from there. And so Elijah and Elisha are kind of almost uh, this interim prophetic period that gets us from the non-writing prophets that are prior to Elisha or Elijah. Nathan, Gad, although there are references to books that they wrote or, or some sort of uh, recordings that they have, that they've taken notes somewhere, until after Elisha, we get almost purely to a written prophets, Hosea all the way through Malachi or Joel, whichever one you want to date last. So then there's this, this transition between the court seer or the court prophets and the, maybe even you want to call it the school of prophets, to miraculous, you still got the school of prophets, but now you got these two big figures that are in charge of the prophets, to now we've got writing prophets that are going to write letters um, or record their prophecies. Um, so that Kings ends up as a, as a book, but not just about kings. You've also got it as a book about prophets, uh, in transitioning from from one to the other, um, but very little mention of priests. So the priests don't show up in kings, just prophets and kings, uh, which is somewhat interesting and somewhat noteworthy. That we're not talking about a priest. Who cares about them? But we got prophets. They're significant. But then we're not even going to talk about prophets when sort of with Elijah. Uh, Jonah is mentioned in passing. Uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah are mentioned in passing. But even then, when Josiah sends men to go figure out what to do with this book of the law, they don't go to Jeremiah. They go to Huldah. 
uh, which there's, a, I think, a reason for that. It's very much a critique on the male leadership in Israel. But could have gone to Jeremiah. He's active. You know, it's not like nobody knows who Jeremiah is. He's been around for 15, 20 years by that point. Could have gone and asked Jeremiah what to do with the book of the law. Nope, we're going to go ask Huldah the prophetess. Maybe they didn't want to go all the way out to Ashtaroth, which isn't that far, but maybe they didn't want to go find Jeremiah. Ah, that's a long way to walk. Let's just ask Huldah. She's here in town. But for whatever reason, they don't go to Jeremiah. They go to her. So even then, the writing prophets are not emphasized all that much. Um, you've just got some of them just being kind of mentioned in passing. Uh, so it's it's a it's a at times it's a boring book, just almost tedious. Uh, who killed who? Almost insignificant in some places, and yet the importance of it in terms of the overall history of Israel is very significant. But when you sit down and try to come up with a lecture of here's the overview of this, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to come up with more than 25 minutes of here's what's significant about the book. Because it's, it's, it's more of that, um, yeah, we went from this to that. Almost like Joshua, you know, the fact that, you know, here we have this historical books class and we kind of get Joshua from the short end of the stick and jump right into the Judges, because Joshua really almost seems to get us from Deuteronomy to Judges. It doesn't seem to have a whole lot else. You know, yeah, we killed a bunch of people. Who? I don't know. All of them. <laughs> you know, at that point, it's, you know, there's a list. I suppose if you really cared, you go through all the cities that have been killed to figure out which kings were killed. But, you know, really, when you read, you get the idea, okay, you killed everybody, and then we sit. That's the book. Well, that's kind of how, kind of how Second Kings reads of in order to get to the prophets the the you know we've got the former prophets is what we call these historical books in order to get to the rest of the prophets and to get to the exile in the post-exilic period in the beginning of of the restoration of israel and the coming of the messiah in order to get to all that we got to get from ahab and elijah to the end so let's kill everybody and sin, and then boom, done. And in some ways, that's what the book, the book reads like. And even the part about Judah reads that way to some degree, because it, we're, we kind of get this sense that we're headed downhill, and whenever we've got a bright spot, he dies. Either he gets himself killed, like Josiah, going and fighting at Megiddo against uh, um, Pharaoh Nico, or he's Hezekiah and just dies of old age. And then you're left with Manasseh. And, well, at least we get Josiah after Manasseh. But still, you're, you're kind of, yay, Israel's going to recover. No, nope, actually, Josiah's going to die, and he's got, well, pretty much every male relative left in his family is wicked. It doesn't matter who they are. And one's going to get killed by the Egyptians. One's going to get taken to Babylon. One's just an idiot and won't listen to anybody and gets himself blinded and then killed. So, you know, the the... Even there, even when you get a bright spot, it's still, you kind of get the sense of this is all headed somewhere and it's not good. Uh, so that you have these wonderful stories, but all they seem to do is delay the inevitable. Uh, and I think probably the, you know, if I had to say not so much theologically, besides the fact that Second Kings just acts as a bridge, it more, I think, highlights um, this idea of a remnant, of you're getting these bright spots, but it's not of a, okay, we're gonna have this resurgence of Israel as much as it is this reminder of not everything was bad. Whereas in the North, you don't ever get the indication that anything was not bad, aside from Elisha and Elijah. Everything else seems bad. Even the man of God who went to the North seemed bad. With Judges, we had the book of Ruth, which is, Ruth is in some ways a, a critique on the judge, the period of the Judges, but at least there's a bright spot. And you kind of get the sense of here of, had they followed Josiah, had they followed Hezekiah, things might have been different. <clears throat> but even then, they had a great king in Josiah, and the moment he's dead, they go back to worshiping four gods. Yeah. And... Uh, and actually, one of the things, there's a couple things in, in Second Kings that we don't often think about, 
that are in the text, we just, as, in terms of when we come up with our, with our timeline, we tend to skip. So when we come to 722 BC in the fall of the Northern Kingdom, we just kind of draw a line through the north. Uh, yep, they're done. And to the degree that that's true, except that we're reminded that there's a lot of people that still live in the north. Um, there's actually quite a bit of archaeology that suggests that not all the cities in the north were destroyed. Uh, Megiddo, for instance, doesn't show any, any signs of having been destroyed. Now, clearly, the people in Megiddo were probably taken into captivity. Um, uh, Tiglath Pileser comes uh, under the reign of, uh, I think it's Pekka or Pekaniah, one of those two, and kills them and takes a bunch into captivity. And then you've got another Assyrian that comes back later and finishes the job off and takes the rest into captivity um, uh, under, uh, under Sennacherib and some of the other ones. Um, but that's not really the end of the North. You have them coming and taking a lot of people from all over the world and putting them in Samaria, hence the term Samaritans. But there are still a lot of Jews that are left, or Israelites that are still left that have not been taken. The people who would just been somewhat inconsequential and irrelevant to any Assyrian policy of we don't need them. You know, why would we take them to why would we take them back with us to Assyria? They're worthless. We'll just leave them here, but we'll mix them in with a bunch of other people. So the result is that the idolatry of the worship of the two golden calves didn't end at, uh, at that time. It's likely, uh, in fact, I think it's even referenced in, um, I don't think it's referenced in Kings, I think it's actually referenced in the records of uh, the King tiglath pileser of them taking the golden calf from Dan, actually taking it with them. Uh, we kind of lose track of it somewhere. I think it ends up, they take it to the border and I think that's the last time it's mentioned. But the one in Bethel continues, because when Josiah goes there, he doesn't go to an abandoned sacrificial area. He goes to an active sacrificial area. Because if it's abandoned, if nobody's worshipped there in 150 years, who cares? Why are you worried about it? But the fact that he goes and feels the need 100 years later, 60 70 years later, you know, it feels the need to go and destroy it, it's actually still going. And it's actually still going strongly. And so he goes and doesn't just destroy an abandoned sacrificial high place, he destroys an active sacrificial high place and burns the, the ashes of the priests on the altar and breaks out the altar and and splits the altar, does all the stuff that was foretold by that man of God back in the first kings. He does that and takes care of that and destroys it and gets rid of the golden calf and kind of cleanses the land of the idolatry, which is somewhat short-lived because as soon as he dies, they go right back. Not necessarily the golden calves, but they will go back to worshiping the Baals and worshiping other foreign gods. Um, but that's something I think that we don't often remember is that it's not it, it is the end of um, it is the end of Northern Kingdom politically. It is not the end of them spiritually. They continue to have an influence even on the Southern Kingdom through idolatry. Baal worship has become really big in the South. Uh, the worship of Asherah has become really big. Manasseh made it big, but a lot of that is influenced by the North. Uh, when King Ahaz, uh, when he sets up the foreign altar in the temple, he didn't get it from the northern kingdom. He got it from Damascus. He got it from the Syrians. And he goes and he takes an image of their altar and he sets it up in the temple courts. But by the time you get to the later kings with Manasseh, they're actually worshiping Asherah. They're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping the false gods that probably came from the north. So they're not necessarily worshiping the golden calves at Bethel, but apparently Josiah thinks that it's enough of an issue that he has to go take care of it, which suggests that maybe there were people from the south that were making a pilgrimage to the north in order to worship the golden calf. Um, 
So he sees it as significant of a problem. I don't know if he necessarily sees it as I need to reunite all of Israel and reclaim all the land because I don't think he makes any effort to get rid of any, I mean, there's no indication anyway that he fights any battle with the Assyrians. Um, in fact, Nebuchadnezzar, or not Nebuchadnezzar, Nico, Pharaoh Nico is actually going to fight against the Assyrians. So Josiah almost seems to be on the side of the Assyrians when he tries to stop Nico from going. So it's not like I'm trying to kick all the Assyrians out of the north and reclaim northern Israel or southern Israel and make us a unified nation again. It really seems to be I've got to stop my people from going and whoring after these gods in the north. Again, just kind of reading between the lines there, it seems to be more what's going on is that he's trying to trying to remove that spiritual influence from the north on the south, um, which we don't often think about. 722 is not the end. It's just the end of the kingdom, not the end of that, of that influence. The other thing that we often forget is that when the north, or when Assyria invaded the north, they also invaded the south. And they invaded the south to the point there was only one town left. So pretty much every town in the entire country, with the exception of Jerusalem, has been destroyed. Uh, even Lachish, which is a major, major fortified city, not that far from Jerusalem, even it has been sacked. Um, it took a, a, over a year for them to sack it because they had built this massive ramp up the side of the walls. Uh, in fact, it's one of the famous um, Assyrian uh, temple reliefs is Sennacherib actually made a, a picture on one of his temples of him sacking the city of Lachish and it has the ramp going up the side of the wall and I think the ramp might actually still be there um, where they, they built almost like they would eventually, the Romans would eventually do at Masada where they would build this giant siege works to get up to, uh, to the city walls and then they went in and killed everybody. And, uh, so, you know, imagine you're in Jerusalem, you're completely surrounded by the Assyrian army, there's nowhere to go, and the last holdout is Lachish, and you can see it burning in the distance. You know, you see the smoke five miles away, 10 miles away, you know, it's not that far away. You can see all the smoke coming up from Lachish, and you know they just killed the last town. And then all 200, 250,000 of the troops are now sitting outside your gates. So when Hezekiah trusts in God, he's not trusting in God of, well, I know they killed the North, but they'll never mess with us. He's kind of at wit's end of, we're it. It's all that's left. All the refugees from all of Israel have fled here to Jerusalem. We were filled to the brim with refugees. We're it. We're the last town left. And why Sennacherib is so confident of, your God is so great. Why hasn't he saved anybody yet? He hasn't saved a single Israelite. I've killed all of them. And yet you're telling me that he's going to save you? Yeah, whatever. And then that night the angel goes out and kills 180,000 of them, which I think took Sennacherib as much by surprise as it did anybody else. Of, you know, this will never, it'll never work. God will never save you. And yet that's exactly what God does. God does save and deliver uh, Jerusalem, um, which is, significant but even judah has had parts of its kingdom taken into captivity in assyria um, they obviously uh regroup as it were um so that after the siege of assyria is lifted the people that were in jerusalem probably stay in the south and they kind of rebuild the southern areas i don't know that they rebuilt lakeish nowhere near as big as it had been but they rebuild and it will be from Hezekiah to the end is probably less than a hundred years. Um, you know, we're, this is seven, 710, 700, somewhere in there, BC, when um, but Sennacherib has come back um, and uh, you know, maybe even closer to 715, 720, somewhere in there. And, 586 is the fall of Jerusalem, and from Josiah to the end is probably 15 years, 20 years, 
So, you know, it's not that far from Hezekiah to, to Josiah. Um, so within that, the meantime, in that hundred years, they're able to rebuild a significant amount. And yet the envoys from Babylon have already come to Hezekiah to see it. Um, because at this point, Assyria is declining and Babylon is really on the increase and will eventually take over the whole known world. Um, so eventually Assyria is no longer a world player. It's completely, completely destroyed. Nineveh will be sacked and the capital will be taken over. And so you've got Babylon from the north or from the south that's gonna mess with Assyria, which is slightly north of them. But then you've also got the rise of the Medes and the Persians, which is kind of taking place after the dominance of, of Nebuchadnezzar in 586, but you know, within 30, 40 years of Nebuchadnezzar, you have the Medes and the Persians coming in and taking over. Uh, so you know, there's, there's some significant world powers that are coming to power there that are destroying, uh, destroying Assyria and just making it nothing. But Hezekiah doesn't know all that as he's in the walls there. He has no idea that uh, what's about to happen. He's just simply trusting God, uh, which I, I think puts his faith really into perspective. Uh, it's not just, yeah, God will save us. It's, uh, well, God doesn't save us, we're dead. This is it. It's not just that they're besieging us, it's they're besieging us and they've killed everybody else. There is nothing left. Um, so it's a, it's a real significant, real significant demonstration of Hezekiah's faith. Um, as for him showing all of his riches to the Babylonians, it's tough to know if he's bragging. <laughs> There's not, it, not a lot there. Yeah, it, it, the text obviously views it negatively. So I wonder if he's kind of bragging of, look how wonderful we are. Um, and yet he's like, well, whatever, I don't care. I'm going to be dead, so I don't care what happens. Uh, it's also strange, actually. He seems to be such a good... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not really sure why he kind of loses uh, loses focus there at the end, but he certainly appears to. So he appears to lose focus. Part of him. Yeah. Seems like no other. Yeah. There's the famous story of the um, of the uh, the sun going backwards. Um, there was a viral email that was going around um, that NASA had uh, created a satellite program that could predict the where the sun would be and all this based on historical records of the sun. And that um, when they ran the computer program, they found that they were like 32 hours off. They couldn't account for the 32 hours. And uh, so according to the story, uh, one of the members of the NASA team was a Christian and pulled out his Bible, and they were able from the story of Joshua having the sun stand still, and from the 15 steps that it goes back on the on the sundial, they were able to calculate that that was the missing time frame that they were uh, that they were looking for. And once they were able to account for that, then the computer program would run correctly, so that NASA can make all of their astrological uh, or astronomical predictions based on the position of the sun. Um, I started getting it via email probably, well, we were using Juno at the time, so that would have been late 90s maybe. Uh, but one of my Old Testament professors, Dr. Younger, got a little curious, and so he started chasing down its origins. And it started appearing in newspapers as early as the 1960s, never with a citation, never with a source, just a random story, and apparently newspaper uh, editors would use it as filler. If ever there was a, you know, they had space where they just needed a stupid story, that's the one that they would put in. But it's been repeated over and over and over and over and over again. There is no, no basis, no scientific proof. NASA knows nothing about it. Actually, I had another professor who offered, he said he would pay for the phone call if I would call NASA and ask about it. And I didn't, but then I found out that Dr. Younger had researched it. There's no need to call NASA and find out the whole thing's baloney. But, but sometimes when, 
when we come to that part in Kings where it talks about the, uh, the time on the, the shadow going backwards, people will find a copy of that story online and uh, be like, yeah, yeah, see, here, here's, here's proof. And yeah, no, not, not as much. So, yeah. The, the book ends on, on a high note, sort of, um, because it ends on a note of a return, sort of. Uh, Jehoiakim is released from prison, which as I mentioned, I think in the lecture I mentioned last time, raises the question of did the writer of Kings know that there was gonna be a return? Had that happened yet? Or is he writing this all in exile before then? And the answer is we don't know. Uh, it all depends on which scholar you ask. Um, the, the, you know, the idea of the Deuteronomistic history would argue that it's all post exilic but then why stop here? Why not mention the return that you have at the end of the Chronicles, which seems much more positive, but he apparently doesn't know about it. Or if he knows about it, he chooses not to and instead thinks that the story of Jehoiakim being released, released from prison is sufficient to be that element of hope. Um, I tend to lean more towards the idea of he wrote it in exile and he doesn't know of a return yet. It hasn't happened yet. Um, and it's fascinating that nobody in later generations cared to add it. They just, they just leave, they leave it on a high note, but not a lot high note. Um, um, there's, a, there's a couple questions related to the, um, the Deuteronomistic history. Actually, let me see, I made a note to myself here. Um, so the, the theory that is often presented has to do with Josiah finding the book of the law. And the theory that is often suggested by people who hold to a less than literal viewpoint or less than a less than historical viewpoint of the Old Testament is that the book of the law that Josiah finds is the book of Deuteronomy. You're not going to get a lot of disagreement from evangelical scholars either of, yeah, he found the book of the law. Deuteronomy seems to be the natural conclusion of what he found uh, because that is the, of the books of the law, that's the one that has the most actual laws in a book. Uh, Numbers has laws scattered here and there. Uh, Leviticus has some laws scattered here and there. But Deuteronomy seems to be, when we talk about laws, that seems to be the natural choice, which is why then we have this focus on the Deuteronomistic history. What's interesting though, is that a number of secular scholars have suggested not that Josiah found the book of the law in the temple, but that he wrote the book of the law and hid it in the temple and then found it in the temple. Uh, so that the Deuteronomist is not so much the in being influenced by the book of Deuteronomy as much as this is the point in history when he began to write it. And so he writes the book of Deuteronomy, he writes this emphasis especially upon them having to worship in Jerusalem. Because it's at this point, although it happened some under Hezekiah that even Sennacherib mentions, at this point they completely eliminate all the high places and say, no, you have to worship in Jerusalem. You may not worship in any of the high places. You cannot worship in your cities. You must worship at the temple and the temple only. And the secular theory among biblical scholars is that Josiah is doing this for political reasons. He is basically saying Jerusalem must be the capital of God's country, must be the capital of God's people, because this is where the temple is. And so you can't worship anywhere else. You must worship here. For the same reasoning that Jeroboam set up the two calves, you're going to worship here because I want your loyalties here. Josiah is saying you have to worship at the temple because your loyalty is here. And so all of this emphasis in the book of Deuteronomy, the place where I will put my name that God keeps referencing uh, throughout the book of Deuteronomy, 
the suggestion is that Josiah is the one who has that put into the book of Deuteronomy as the book of Deuteronomy is being written so that he can point to it and say, see, see, you have to worship in Jerusalem. Uh, so this is the, this is one of the quirks, as it were, of the Deuteronomistic history is that it's not, not everybody's this way, but a lot of people are not just, you've got a single Deuteronomist who's writing this, it's that you've got a Deuteronomist who's kind of back writing, as it were, that he's, he's back writing into the book of Deuteronomy things that are important for him then. Uh, and this is the same even with the book of Chronicles, that one of the reasons why secular scholars will, will try to emphasize when the book is written and say, oh, well, it was written after the exile is that they want to have that be the interpretive lens through which you view the book itself. So we're not viewing the book of Chronicles as what's going on in Solomon's day. They want us to view the book of Chronicles and what's going on in the Chronicler's day. And they want to say that the Chronicler's day must be, you know, two to three hundred BC and that it's really late and it's been influenced by the Greek. Uh, by the Greeks, uh, by the Greeks, it's been influenced by them, and, and it's, you know, it's post-Persian, it's post, even, you know, Alexander the Great-ish time period, um, which sounds great, except that there's not necessarily a historical background for that. There's no proof for that. And the same with kings of you know, to say that Kings was written during the exile doesn't really fit their connection with, no, this has to be a deuteronomistic um, emphasis, either emphasizing in the time of Josiah, you have to worship at Jerusalem, or emphasizing the time when the Deuteronomist is writing after the exile of, you have to worship in Jerusalem, trying to emphasize again the temple so that he's, again, writing back into history something that, they need right then. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen The Hunger Games or read the books, The Hunger Games. Those were popular about 15 years ago. Movies came out not too long ago. But there's a scene where they're doing the second quell that you find in the books, the 75th quell, where they have a reaping of all the victors for all the previous quells. And, but he pulls out this like weathered piece of yellowed paper from this box of, of uh, you know, supposed to have the instructions for each quell, and that this is the quarter quell. And here are special instructions for the quarter quell. And yet, as you're reading the books and watching the movie, you know, he just made this up. This has absolutely nothing to do with, you know, this is not, the designers of the games did not design this, did not come up with this. It's politically expedient for him at that point in the history of, of Pan Am to get rid of all the victors. And what better way to get rid of all the victors than sending them back into the Hunger Games and having them kill each other. So he's not reading a historical document. He's reading a document he came up with that morning. And that's basically the suggestion that that's what Josiah is doing, that Josiah is writing a document to achieve a political end, and that the Deuteronomist then is influenced by either is Josiah or is working with Josiah or in another theory is writing after the exile, but still trying to emphasize the one temple for political purposes it has to be Jerusalem it has to be the temple trying to get everybody to worship there, uh, which is a, um, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting theory, no weight to it, but it's an interesting theory and you can see why they would think that. Um, one of the uh, proofs that's often used in the New Testament for why the New Testament writers did not make up the Gospels is the fact that they never bother, as they're making up Jesus, to have him deal with any of the issues that were significant in the early church. I mean, you would think if here you are making up this religion and you're one of the biggest questions that's going to come up within about 15 years of the death of Christ is, do you have to be circumcised? You would think that you would just conveniently have your made-up Messiah mention that. 
but oops, we forgot to put that in, so we have to call the council because we forgot to have our faith Jesus talk about circumcision or meat sacrifice to idols or any other number of issues. And obviously that's because it's real and Jesus didn't care to talk about that. But if you're going to make it up, you think you would put all that in there. Same with Josiah of, okay, that's interesting. That deals with the temple. What about all these other issues? I mean, there's a lot of things that could have come up that he could have put in there, like rebuilding the temple for one, or, uh, you know, what do we do about intermarriage with, uh, that's a big issue in Ezra and Nehemiah. That doesn't, I mean, some people will say that Deuteronomy speaks quite a bit about that, but it doesn't seem to speak a whole lot about foreign women. It seems to speak a lot about the women in fellow Israelite women that you're not allowed to marry. So it's just, it's, again, there's issues that if Josiah was going to sit down and make up the book, he would think that he would have included it in there, that he doesn't. You think he had more of an emphasis on kings? Um, it's just chapter 17, so a chapter that really deals with kings. And you would think if you're writing a book on the kingdom, where there's never been a king, you know, there's never been a... Uh, there's never been anything else written about kings. You think you would be careful to actually put in a bunch of stuff about kings, but he doesn't. So it would seem that if you're going to go with that theory, that basically Josiah is only concerned about the temple. He's not concerned about the kingdom. He's not concerned about Israel. He's just concerned about the temple, which is pretty hard to, to defend. I think. Um, but that's, that is one of the, one of the leading theories that you'll often read about is that uh, that Josiah is the one who either wrote or commissioned Deuteronomy. And so if you're reading a secular scholar on, on any of the historical books, you'll often see that mentioned uh, as part of this Deuteronomistic history, uh, which is unfortunate because it's just ridiculous, but it seems to have convinced a lot of scholars. Just that's a lot of acrobatics to go through to have a lens. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't even believe that certain cities existed that are mentioned in the Bible until they excavate them, mm -hmm. and yet they've created. Yep. I mean, I get wanting to have something that makes sense to view all of these books through, especially mm -hmm. if you don't understand that they're inspired, but. Mm -hmm. We came up with that. Yep. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, one other question we were talking about Josiah and and the Holda issue is there was this one guy down in um, South Africa and his paper was written in Dutch. So I'm going off of Google Translate. So no. I may not have understood it correctly, but I think I got what he was saying. He was suggesting that Holda they went to a prophetess because you know instead of jeremiah or anybody else there was a certain proclivity to go to a prophetess it had to do with sort of the sort of the witch culture or mm -hmm. the, the worship of ashra or mm -hmm. sort of the female yes she's a prophetess but more so culturally they viewed her as having special mystical powers yeah what do you do with that and i was like oh that's interesting but yeah, it's an interesting theory. Sort of the same reason Saw goes to the Witch of Endor and yeah. all other things. He was linking it to that, but again, it was in Dutch and I was like, that. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see why why you why a scholar would think, well, it's natural they would go to her because women were such you know held in side regard yeah. because of Asherah. But she's not a prophetess of Asherah. Yeah, she's known to be a prophetess of Yahweh, who, depending on what uh, what religion, what version of Asherah, you know, there's Asherah, there's Ashtaroth, there's Ash Astarte, there's, they're all the same names. But some of them are married to Baal, one of them is considered to be married to Yahweh. Um, I think it's Asherah mm -hmm. is married to Yahweh supposedly, in some versions. But even then, you would think that if the, if the goddess is the most important, 
you would think then that you would go to a um, a god or a prophetess of the goddess, not a prophetess of the god, mm -hmm. because now you're emphasizing Yahweh over Asherah. And yeah, it's Yahweh's book, but it's Yahweh's book that says don't worship Asherah. So to go to a you know, to go to a female because of the connection with Asherah and the goddess, when the very book that you found, you're going to her and you're asking, are we going to be judged by Yahweh for having followed other gods and goddesses, including Asherah? Mm. It seems odd then, you know, it seems like you'd almost be tempting fate of, I think God's going to judge us for worshiping Asherah. Let's go ask the Asherah prophetess if God's going to judge us for consulting Asherah. Which would make sense if you're a kind of historian who believes that Josiah was writing the book. Right. And then he goes to hold off for permission, and she says, okay, Yahweh's going to judge you for this. And so he writes a book then that is Yahweh's going to judge. Right. That would make more sense. Yeah. So if you were crafting the whole thing, yeah. then sure, that would make sense to include Holda. Um, because her response also makes him look really bad. Well, I know her response is like, go tell that man, that idiot mm -hmm. sent me to you. Yep. I mean, she never refers to him as king. She never <laughs> refers to him by name. It's always She's that man. So <laughs> Which in some ways, I think in most ways, is telling, is basically telling them the opposite of, you consulted me because I'm a prophetess. Of Basically, you should not have been consulting me because you should have, as men, known what you were supposed to do. She's, I think in some ways she's basically telling them, look guys, this isn't rocket science. You read a book, it said don't worship gods or you will die. You worship other gods, now you're gonna die. What is confusing about this? This isn't confusing. This, you know how to read as much as I do. It says don't worship other gods. You worshiped other gods. It says if you do, there will be punishment. Now you're being punished and now you can't figure out why. You know, in some ways, I'm, I'm almost, it, it reminds me a little bit of even the passage we're talking about on Sunday of 1 Samuel 14. Of Sam, or, uh, Saul looks out and sees all the Philistines running. And so he consults the, um, the Ark of the Covenant. Should I go out and chase them, basically? And it's like, Saul, you're a professional soldier. What did you think was going to be the answer? No, I just watch. Or, no, I'll go home. Or, no, feel, you know, have a party. You're a soldier. Yeah, you should fight, because that's what soldiers do. The fact that you even have to ask that seems ridiculous. Why would you even ask the question? Don't you feel a little foolish of asking the question? Of, so are they doing the same thing that Balaam was doing? Is going yes. Back and asking God over and over and over again. He knows the answer. Yep. He just wants permission to do what he knows he's not supposed to do. Right. Or vice versa. So, yes, you are supposed to go out and fight the Philistines. What you want me to say is, no, you don't have to do anything because you're Saul and you don't like to do anything. <laughs> you want to stay home because you don't like to fight. And so you're going to come up with any excuse you can to not fight. And I'm not going to give you one. I'm going to tell you to go fight. And you're going to actually have to go fight. And I almost wonder if it's the same thing with Hulda. Uh, seriously, guys, you're not here to ask me what's going to happen. You're here because you know what's going to happen and you don't like it. And you're hoping that I will tell you Oh, yeah, that was written years ago. Don't worry about it. You can keep worshiping foreign gods. It's okay. And what I'm going to tell you is you're a bunch of idiots, and of course you can't worship other gods. How is this confusing? This isn't confusing. It's, it means exactly what it says. It's written, it's written in very plain Hebrew. Don't worship other gods, or I will curse you. You're being cursed. How can you not put two and two together? So you go back and you tell that man is being dumb and that he needs to be a man and actually do what he's supposed to do. He is the king of Israel. Tell him to man up and do what he's supposed to do, which Josiah does. He does man up. He goes out, does what he's supposed to do, mans up, spawns this whole revival. They follow the Passover. They get rid of the foreign gods. They do all that. It's short-lived because when he dies, they go back to it. But at least for a time, he is a man and he, he does lead. And uh, so Hulda is, is being used by God there to challenge him to actually do what he's supposed to do, uh, which is, is good. That's, that's what he needs to do. He needs to, needs to man up and be
be the leader that he's called to be. Um, how, so, is the, how is the deuteronomistic history idea faring among academia now? Because I got the impression that it was starting to be a bit passe, or people were looking mm -hmm. at other explanations, even like secular scholars. Yes, I would say we're about in the same place with the deuteronomistic history that we are with source criticism of Genesis and the Pentateuch, of JEDP, of you still come across people who hold it. You still have to pretend when you write that you believe it, whether you believe it or not. Um, it's still, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's academically frowned upon to challenge it, but it's becoming more acceptable to remind everybody that there were people at that time that challenged it. So Martin Note, N O T H. Martin Note is the guy who came up with the primary theory, but he was immediately challenged by Wellhausen, who's the guy that came up with JEDP, and by Von Rod. They were both like, "That's no, stupid. That's not what's going on here." And uh, and those guys were pretty much just ignored. Uh, now they were revered because of their other theories. Uh, Von Rod is held up as a classic Old Testament theologian, and Wellhausen obviously has source theory, so everybody remembers that. But now Wellhausen is being challenged, and we've kind of dropped the J and the E, and we're just kind of down to the D and maybe the P sometimes, if people feel like it. Uh, so that, we've kind of poked holes in that enough, and that's kind of where I feel like we're at with, with the Deuteronomistic history of yeah, I don't know that we need to go as crazy as Josiah found the law and he, you know, made it up and wrote this for political gain. Um, so now it's okay that, you know, when you talk about it, you can point out, yeah, but Wellhausen and Runrod did not go for this. And uh, I think Eisfeld was the other guy who didn't really like the idea. And so you can mention that now. And you can maybe even say why you see some weakness in the position. Mm -hmm. So we're not, we haven't completely dismissed it, but it's, it's in the process of breaking. The um, audit generation is ceasing. Yes, as in terms of what replaces it, I don't I'm still thinking know. Is crazy, but. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. In seminaries, is there kind of a, standard evangelical alternative to those frameworks or just kind of yeah i mean probably at least within mainstream or uh or you know reformed biblical evangelicalism it's you know moses wrote the five books of moses um as for samuel and kings joshua and judges there's not really an alternative theory um it seems as though similar to the way that i've taken it they just don't address it um, we don't know who wrote it, we'll just leave it at that. Um, Most of Sean's professors at Perkins Jackson went through it. And like, okay, this is why, this is why, this is why, this is dumb. And then like, we, we don't have really our own particular reform niche in this area that would just, mm -hmm. what these other secular scholars have come up with is garbage, mm -hmm. academically too. Um, mm -hmm. There's not really a whole lot of support for either mm -hmm. JD, JEDP or Deuteronomistic mm -hmm. History. Yeah. yeah, I mean, JEDP is even even David Kleins, who used to be the head of SBL, Society for Biblical Literature, which is fairly liberal. Even he made fun of it by submitting a paper on Winnie the Pooh to the SBL National Conference. <laughs> and he, wrote it, he wrote parts of it in German, so nobody knew what it was on because he called it the Pooh Book, P-U-H-B-U-C-K, Pooh Book, which they just thought was German for something. <laughs> and he got up on the floor of SBL and read an academic paper on JEDP, but on source theory used to demonstrate how Winnie the Pooh is really about the fertility goddess that's represented by honey, and that nobody in their right mind would ever think there was really one author of Winnie the Pooh because sometimes it's Pooh Bear, sometimes it's Winnie, sometimes it's Winnie the Pooh, sometimes it's Silly Old Bear, 
you know, a very, a very average brain. I mean, he's, he's brilliant in how he goes through it, but people were furious because he was basically mocking them and telling them they're all, they're all stupid. And to some degree, the same is true of uh, the Deuteronomistic history. Uh, yeah, there is significant similarity between Joshua, Judges, and First and Second Samuel. I think to some degree, I would even be comfortable saying that they were written by the same guy. Uh, to suggest that he also wrote Deuteronomy because those books reference Deuteronomy seems like a jump in logic of it's the book of the law. What else is he going to reference? I mean, there's only five books out there. Genesis through Deuteronomy. Uh, you know, Leviticus is all about priests. He's not writing about priests. He's writing about kings. So he's not going to mention that one. He's not going to mention Exodus because it's all about the tabernacle and the escape from Egypt. He's not going to mention Genesis. It's all about the patriarchs. Numbers is all about the wandering. The only book left that has anything that could be applicable to kings is Deuteronomy. Well, because he quoted Deuteronomy, it must be the writer of Deuteronomy. Like, that is a big jump in logic. I mean, that's just, yeah, that, that goes beyond the realm of sound reason. And yet, I think that's basically what they're doing here. Yeah. And then since he found a book, what well, must be, he must have written Deuteronomy. So even that is a big leap in logic. I was thinking about it today um, in regards to the way the book of Luke starts out. Yeah. And kind of like an older, obviously I don't know Greek. This is what tends to be told me. Uh -huh. Like an older style Greek. Yeah. Because he's referencing the history of the Old Testament. Sure. And so why would, I guess it seems like, you know, why would you not start out this book that is building upon this other book with referencing it or uh -huh. paying homage to yeah. the way that it's written? Yeah. I feel like that's very logical. Yes. You don't need to say. No. You know, also yeah. knows the Old I mean, the book of Jeremiah is almost like a commentary on Deuteronomy, or a commentary on Israel using Deuteronomy, maybe be a better way to put it. But I don't think that anybody has ever suggested that Jeremiah wrote Deuteronomy. He's using it. But some people will say, well, he was one of Josiah's lackeys, and he's critiquing Israel in light of this new book of the law that's just been written. Um, but even that doesn't make sense because Josiah is trying to say, it's all about the temple. It's all about, you have to worship here. You have to worship here. It's all, you can't worship anywhere else. You got to worship here. And then here comes Jeremiah that says the temple's worthless, which completely contradicts everything that supposedly Josiah was just saying. So which is it? <laughs> you, you got the one king who's saying, can't worship anywhere else. It's got to be here. And you got the other guy who's saying, yeah, you don't have any confidence in that building. So you got two voices that are supposedly working together or existing at the same time. And you've got the pro-temple faction and the anti-temple faction. And you've got, you know, all of these different groups, but there's no evidence for any of them. It's just, well, you know, this chapter of Isaiah is very pro-temple. And this one seems very anti-temple. Therefore, it must be two people. And... Like, yeah, maybe, but there's nothing that requires it to be. Uh, I mean, I, I read a paper the other day and uh, for my dissertation, and I was critiquing it, because that's the chapter I'm on, and uh, on Tamar, Amon, or Amon, and uh, Absalom. And that Amon, or Amon, or whatever you want to call his name is, Amnon, thank you, Amnon, uh, <laughs> that doesn't sound right, Amnon, uh, <laughs> Yes, you're all going to <laughs> Amnon, uh, he, he thinks that the only way that he will have a claim to the throne of David is to marry into Absalom's family, because Absalom has more resources and more power and clout than Amnon. So he's going to take Tamar as a way to take the resources from Absalom's family shame and belittle the family of, of Absalom, but make himself seem more powerful because he defeated the household of Absalom by taking Tamar. And so in my, in my response, I put, it's very difficult to critique the, uh, the theory uh, of 
uh, essentially Victor Matthews, who's really well respected. Uh, it's it's very difficult to critique his theory because there's absolutely no evidence for anything he says anywhere in the text. So he's just he's redefining everything just for the fun of redefining it. That's not how they even asserted themselves. I mean, if you went nope. to sleep with somebody, you grabbed all the people's compromise and you did it in front of everybody. Yes. You didn't assault the people or the person's sister. Nope. Right away, you right. and yes, which or he does get himself killed. <laughs> Absalom has no. Absalom has no option but to kill Amnon, but when he murders him in front of all the other brothers, he's basically asking all the other brothers for their political support so that he can be king. Which they they all say no and run back to Jerusalem. Like that's creative. Don't know where you're getting any of it. Amnon is actually the firstborn. He is David's firstborn. There's no indication that Absalom has more power than Amnon. If anything, anybody reading the text would assume Amnon's going to be the next king. So he actually, Victor Matthews actually suggests that um, the friend of, of Amnon, starts with a J, I can't remember his name, that he's... John or Dad? Yeah, yeah, that's him, John or Dad. He, he's actually a plant from Absalom. Absalom sends Jonadab to spread false advice to Amnon the same way that David will later send Hushai back to spread false advice to Absalom. It's like, again, creative, right. not in the text. So it doesn't make any sense. None of it's in the text. So <laughs> the thought that maybe, maybe, just maybe, Amnon had the hots for his half-sister and decided, oh, oh, this is the other thing. He had her come and cook for him, not because he wanted to be close to her, but because he was convinced that somebody, possibly Absalom, was poisoning his food. And so he's actually asking her to come and run his kitchen for him to make sure that he is not poisoned. Do these guys not understand how men work? I, apparently, Victor Matthews doesn't have that problem, I guess. I don't know. I, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's like... Yeah, come on, he saw a pretty girl and he wanted her. It's also, really no more, it's what it said. It's yeah. a more complicated than it's that. It's way harder. I mean, holy cow, yep. just read the text. Yes. And so uh, Tamar's There's response geez. is basically, I, I should have just printed it out and let y'all read it because it's so <laughs> ridiculous. Tamar is basically telling Amnon that we need to negotiate this. This is a negotiated contract, and so we need to negotiate. And now you can't rape me, you need to negotiate with David because then you can have, you know, be king and all that. And if you rape me, then you'll lose everything. And it's like, wow, this is, this is ridiculous. I'm reading this and I'm just thinking, I don't know where you're getting any of this. Like none of this is in the text, not even close. I mean, this is beyond the level of bizarre. But sometimes when I read some of these theories of the Deuteronomistic history, I think the same thing of, so Josiah had an entire book of 31, 32 chapters written from Moses' perspective, wrote the book in order to convince everybody that they have to worship only in Jerusalem, even though 85% of the book has absolutely nothing to do with worshiping in Jerusalem. <laughs> There's just a few verses here and there, you know, like chapter, I think it's chapter 16, 15 and 16, talk about, you know, you must worship at the, at the one, at the place that I will cause my name to dwell. And he repeats that over and over again in that chapter. But no, Josiah didn't write the one chapter, he wrote the whole book about a bunch of other stuff that has nothing to do with that. You know, because nothing would serve Josiah's political ends more than to write about the cities of refuge in chapter 19. That clearly fits exactly in with his, with his political ambitions. But yeah, he finds the book of the law, which he made up, finds it, plants it, finds it, applies it, and yet it's all for political gain. And, you know, but really the, so, you know, you've got that theory on the one hand of Josiah starts this, then you got the theory on the other hand that the Deuteronomist is kind of working later than Josiah and putting this all together. And so sometimes you'll see uh, in scholarly works, you'll see DTR, capital D, and then TR, and that's the Deuteronomist. 
Um, but sometimes you'll see DTR1, DTR with a one foot note, or DTR2, like a, either a square, you know, like squared, DTR squared, or sometimes it'll be a subscript two. But sometimes you'll see DTR2, R1, and that's the, the second Deuteronomist first, recent, or first redaction or the second redaction. I mean, people will just go on and on and on with these theories. And it's like, but what are you basing this on? You're, you're coming up with this just outrageous theory rather than just viewing it at face value and saying, you know, okay, um, yeah, he had the hots for his sister. Uh, Josiah actually found the book of the law in the temple. Are we really surprised that the book of the law is in the temple? I mean, where else would the book of the law be than in the temple? It makes complete sense why in the temple you would find a book of the law. And why, since you haven't used the temple in generations, at least 50 years under Manasseh, it makes sense why nobody knows that the book of the law is in the temple. And that nobody even knows that there is a book of the law. It all makes sense if you just take it at face value. But that doesn't sell books or get papers published or Yeah, I was about to say, whatever. your whole idea of academic success is publishing a theory that nobody's thought of before. Yep. Which is really hot water. <laughs> That's a theory. Dude, from... what's his name? Um, I forgot his name. I want to have a beer with him. Holy cow, he sounds hilarious. The guy, the poo guy. Yeah. Did he ever get published after that? Oh, yeah. Be... Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> and he's got some stuff that's not out there, but he's yeah. got some, I mean, he's not a, um, well, he's the head of SBL, or was the head right. of SBL. He's not a, he's not evangelical. No, I think. I, I wouldn't say that he's even a Christian or biblical. I mean, yeah. he's got some, He's got some other books that I've read of his that you're just kind of like, really? That's where you're going with this? Yeah. Of, you know, he's got some interesting ideas, but nothing as crazy as JEDP. So for a fellow secular scholar to go after who's him. not an inerrantist, he's not, doesn't believe in inspiration of scripture, doesn't even believe it's true. He's very much a, you know, history of religions kind of guy. And he's big into historical criticism. So he rejects any sort of supernaturalism as well, because that's his, you know, his bias. Even he thinks JEDP is ridiculous. Then you're kind of left with, okay, maybe this is dumb. Maybe this is dumb. So, I, I mean, if you're not familiar with JEDP, the whole idea is that every time the name of God switches in Genesis, it's a different author. So J is the guy who always refers to God as Yahweh, which starts in chapter two. And E is the guy who refers to God as Elohim, which is chapter one. And yet, if you count up all the occurrences of Yahweh in the first four chapters of Genesis and all the occurrences of Elohim in the first four chapters of Genesis and add them together, you get exactly 70, which doesn't seem like coincidence to me. So you're left with either J and E are the same guy, Moses, or J and E compared notes before they published. <laughs> Neither of which seems to make any sense at all, because after, uh, after Wellhausen, the next guy who came along was, um, I just lost his name, starts with a G. Uh, he actually went one step back and said that actually these are oral traditions that were then worked into, um, into this, into these written sources that were then created to use to create the book of Genesis. So he even goes a step back, which is even more ridiculous. So, so not only did they not compare notes, they also didn't even talk to each other because they weren't even part of the same group. So it just it becomes it becomes just silly. Um, well, one thing. Um, I need to take a break here in just a second. But one thing that I'd like us to look at and talk about for just a moment, just because it's a significant thing that's often mentioned, is if we read here in 1 Kings 19, and look at verse 15 and 16. Of chapter 19. And then uh, 
thought it was Second Kings six, but I'm not seeing it there. It's gonna be great when I find it. <laughs> this one was second thing six. Let's spoil the suspense. Please tell us what you're looking for. <laughs> I was looking, oh, here it is. Uh, second Kings nine. So second Kings nine, you got that. Second Kings 19, or first Kings 19 to Elijah, go anoint Jehu, go anoint Ben Hadad. No, excuse me, Hazel. He's going to kill Ben Hadad. And then you got in Second Kings 9, you have Elisha calling one of the sons of the prophets and saying, Go anoint Jehu. And then um, so then Jehu does his little thing. And then in Second um, Kings eight, verse uh, beginning in verse ten, you have Elisha with Hazael. So we've got God telling Elijah, "Go anoint these people." And yet, when we get to Second Kings, we don't see him, Elijah, because he's gone, anointing anybody. We don't even see Elisha anointing Jehu. We see some random man of God. So how do we put First Kings 19 with Second Kings 8 and 9 of anointing, but he doesn't do the anointing? All right, so what do we think? If you're doing your reading and so, um, speed jack, do a little bit. Yeah, it's like locution, illocution. Yeah. yeah, it seems like people who are into that would be excited about this. But, uh huh. But yeah. I guess it just seems like something similar to the dynamic that works through prophets, I guess. I mean, it's God's word, but God uses human beings to enact that word and speak it. Mm -hmm. Maybe something kind of analog to that the prophet kind of in the position of God and mm -hmm. listening to other people to do stuff. Yeah. Which is my thought that mm -hmm. I think especially yeah. with Elijah taking up the mantle of uh -huh. Elijah, like he's kind of walking in the same spirit, you know, uh -huh. or greater 
When we read 1 Kings 19, what do we assume is going to happen? Yeah, it's going to happen, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, like if you were to describe it to somebody, somebody says to you, um, hey, what's God telling Elijah there to do? How would you explain it to him? In the same order that God was telling him. Okay, but you know, describe it for me. What does that look like? Well, he says, I guess he says, go anoint Hazel first. Okay, then, but what, is, what does that mean? Anoint Hazel. Pour oil on his head. Okay, yeah. And plus him. Yeah, so we're assuming that he's going to take, he's going to take a thing of oil, mm -hmm. and he's going to go to where Hazel is, and he's going to dump it on his head and say, you're anointed. Which would be, I think, at first. I can't think of any other instance where there's a non Israelite king actually being anointed. So that's, that's one oddity. Um, two, it appears that when we come to Elijah or Elisha talking to Hazael, that Hazael has no idea that he's going to be the next king. Which again is very odd, because how could he not know he's going to be the next king? He's already been anointed by Elijah. So that's another oddity. Uh, and then um, what does anointing represent? Kingship. Kingship. But I mean, who, who in the Old Testament is anointed? Chosen by God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got priests. Yeah, I mean, prophets occasionally. Yeah. Kings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, it sometimes even represents the almost the idea of the empowering of the spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have your Bible still. Look at Isaiah chapter 45. What does God call Cyrus? Is anointed. So who anointed Cyrus? Yeah? Is there any oil involved? What's that? <laughs> you, you don't know? <laughs> the pregnant lady says, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Go ahead, like olive oil or something. Yeah. I mean, my I guess would be. My guess would be that there was no actual anointing, that the anointing with the oil represented a different type of anointing. So you could skip the actual sign, the actual symbol of anointing, and just go straight to the actual anointing. So that when we use the word anointed, we could almost replace it with the word appointed or empowered. So, so Romans 13 ish. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as God is talking to Elijah, he's telling him you need to go and find your replacement because we're getting near the end here. Okay. And Actually, he says even back there in 1 Kings 19 that he's supposed to anoint Elijah. But we don't usually see prophets anointed with oil. Usually it's just priests and kings. But we do see an anointing on prophets in terms of the spirit coming upon them. Which certainly happens for Elisha. So in that sense, I think we've often... 
we've often read into the word anointing that because it says anointed, he has to be anointed. Which, at least in Jesus' case, he's the anointed, he's the Messiah, which comes from the word uh, Messiah, which means, or Masach is the verb, Messiah is the, is the noun, which means to anoint with oil. And yet we only see Jesus anointed with oil once, and when he's anointed with oil, he says it has nothing to do with his kingship, it has to do with his burial that she's preparing me for burial, that she has anointed me with this alabaster jar of oil on my head. And then the second time on his feet, which has nothing to do with kings, that would be kind of weird, it's always on the head. So, you know, if, if Jesus had knelt down in front of John the Baptist and John the Baptist had anointed him, the closest we get is baptism, but there doesn't seem to be any direct correlation between baptism and, and the anointing with oil, but there is a correlation between anointing with oil in the Old Testament, the anointing of the Spirit, and the baptism of Jesus and the descent of the dove on him and his baptism. So there is an anointing in a sense, even though there's no oil. There's an appointing, there's an empowering, there's a filling. And so in that sense, Elijah, I think, is being told, start the process of having Elisha have a, another guy go and actually tell ben Heda or Hazael that he's going to be king over ben Heda. Is it possible that when Elijah hears this from God, he just doesn't know who these people are? I mean, it may be. Yeah, it's possible. He's going to go find him. Yeah, so it might, it might have been J.P. He was in the north of the kingdom. Do you know mm -hmm. who the military commanders are in Syria? Like, yeah, you know, eventually you're going to necessarily honor these guys and then you're going to have to anoint them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is a sense in there in 1 Kings 19 that even as he's, as God is talking to him, you know, he's just finished saying, um, uh, verse 14, um, you know, he's complaining of, I'm the only one left. And God's response is, not has nothing to do with the fact that you're not the only one left until after he's told all this stuff about anointing. So it's not until verse 18 that he talks about 7,000 who have not bowed to Baal. But his response when he says, I'm the only one left, and they're all seeking to kill me. So go back to Damascus, <laughs> and, and you can almost picture Elijah being like, Were you listening? Were you listening when I was complaining, pouring out my heart? Yeah, 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 we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But for now, Go back to Damascus, and on the way, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And so I think some of it is, uh, you know, you're going to find these people, and you're going to begin the process of them being next in line. So, yeah, you need to go through Damascus, but... You know, maybe some of it is you're going to go through Damascus and you're going to point out, hey, Dad, and you're going to say to Elisha, hey, see a guy over there? You need to make him the next king. Okay, let's go on. I mean, you know, the word anointed doesn't necessarily mean that he went up to him and anointed him. It could simply mean he went up and, you know, that's him. Or even he goes to Damascus and he's like, anybody over there is that Hazael? Is there any Hazael around here? Um, I mean, it doesn't give a whole lot of detail. Um, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Excellent. How many Hazels do you think are in Syria? <laughs> so I'm going to go to Damascus and I'm going to find Hazael. And you know, maybe he just goes and finds him. And then once he finds him, he tells Elisha, found him. That's the guy. Bye. Take care of it. See ya. Uh, so some of it is just keeping in mind the way that the books are written. Of the, the writers are smart enough to know. And this is the one thing I think that hurts me the most about secular scholarship, is that the writers are smart enough to know as they're writing that there's an inconsistency. They're not dumb. So the fact that they would leave the inconsistency, I mean, similar to what we saw in 1 Samuel of 
1 Samuel chapter 10, Samuel tells Saul, wait for me seven days in Gilgal. Then we've got chapters 11 and 12 that theologically follow from chapter 10. Chapter 10 ends with worthless fellows say, who can save us? Chapter 11 is, oh, I guess Saul's not as bad as we thought. Chapter 20 is, 12 is, oh crap, he is as bad as we thought. Chapter 13 is seven days of Gilgal. So theologically, they make sense in the order that they're in. But the writer of Samuel is not dumb. It's not like he's going to be like, oh, seven, oh, we had another seven days? Really? Well, I didn't, I didn't wait another seven days of Gilgal. What do you know? Oh, he knew. And he wants us to connect chapter 13 with chapter 10 and be able to say, they're the same seven days. And yes, Saul lasted seven days as king. He wants us to come to that conclusion. Uh, even if it's a completely different seven days, he wants us to connect them together and think of them as the same day. He's deliberately set it up that way because nobody in their right mind would read it differently. Wait seven days at Gilgal. He waited seven days at Gilgal. Clearly they're the same seven days. Even if they're not, they're described as the same seven days. So same thing here. Uh, he's not dumb. It's not like he forgot, oh, oh, did I tell Elijah that? Oh, my bad. I meant Elisha. You know, even I can't keep him straight. No, no, this is this is not, yeah, that might sound the same to us, but no, this is not confusion on the part of the writer of Kings. He knows exactly what he's doing. And you know, so this is almost like other instances where here, do this, now here's how it came about. Here's how it happened. You know, day six, God made man, made man in our image. Then you got chapter two, is he making more men? No, he's telling us how he made the first one. You know, no tree had yet come up on the field, and so we're on day six here, as God is making man out of dust and making woman from man. So he's describing to us, this is how, that thing that I mentioned, here's how it happened. And I think this is a similar thing of, okay, this is how he went and found Elisha. This is how he went and found Jehu. This is how Elisha went and anointed Jehu and then had somebody else go and anoint Hazael. But it's all a process that Elijah put into practice. I mean, even when you read 1 Kings, or excuse me, 2 Kings chapter 8, um, there in um, verse 7. Now Elisha came to Damascus. Uh, ben Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told the man of God is here. Uh, which, again, as you're reading this, you're thinking, that all sounds very convenient. So Elisha is, uh, is here, and um, Hazael goes to meet him. And you wonder, has Elisha ever met Hazael at this point? I don't know. But there's nothing in the text that, that says that he's going to become, you know, it says in verse 13, the Lord has shown me that you are to be king over Syria. How much of it is the Lord showed him directly rather than the Lord showed Elisha who showed him? There's nothing in the text that requires that the Lord actually told Elisha directly. Any more than at Eve in Genesis says, well, God has told us. Well, yeah, he did. He told Adam, and Adam told her. So it's very possible that God told Elijah, and Elijah tells Elisha. That doesn't really change anything. Uh, so, you know, as we're reading this, there isn't something that needs to jump out at us and say, oh, wait a minute, this is wrong. Because there's nothing in it that makes it seem wrong other than our way of reading things. I mean, even the fact that we read chapter 8 as being a significant amount of time after 1 Kings 19, which is also not necessarily true. So, you know, what's to say that this didn't happen pretty early on? And even there in, um, in chapter 9, verse 1, go and anoint Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi. Um, so that's what he does. He goes to Ring Gilead and he anoints him. 
You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord, and cut them off from the house of Ahab. And I'll make the house of Ahab like Jeroboam and like the house of Basha. We don't really know that a significant amount of time has passed. Because we don't really know how long it took um, Elisha, you know, Elijah, to actually go and do any of the stuff that he was told to do. So it, it makes, it causes us to make a lot of assumptions about the text that we can't necessarily make. We can't make them one way, we also can't make them the other. We can't, we can't prove that the Lord did actually appear directly to Elisha. We also can't prove that he didn't. So some of it is, okay, we're taking the text at face value because that's how the writer wants us to take it. And he's, he's not dumb, and he's also being guided by God in the midst of this. And God is certainly not dumb. So that as we're reading the text, anything that we see as a contradiction either is not a contradiction or was not a contradiction to the writer. Because again, he's not dumb. He's not looking at this and thinking, oh man, I can't believe I missed that one. You know, I, sometimes I'll write a paper or something and I'll go back and read it later and be like, oops, typo. Yeah, he's, he's not reading this thinking that. Gosh, I remember when I wrote Second Kings, whew, a lot of typos in that one. He's not thinking that. He's, it's written exactly the way that he wants it, exactly the way that God wants it. Uh, and any theories that uh, that smooth out those difficulties, they make us feel better, but they don't necessarily do what the author wanted us to do. Because we could simply say in chapter 8 and chapter 9 that it's Elijah and not Elisha. Problem solved. It's a typo. It's supposed to be Elijah, but because Elijah has already gone back to heaven, later copiers of the book changed it from Elijah to Elisha because that made more sense in terms of the chronology. Boom, we just solved the problem. Took care of a major issue. Boom. Yeah, good, I'm sure. I'd probably get it published too. <laughs> uh, but the, yeah, so it may have solved the problem, but there's no evidence for it one way or the other. So this could be like a line issue people write papers about, like trying to oh. figure out this. Uh huh. Yep. It just seems like such a non-issue. Yes. Yeah. Yep. There, there's in every book. There's um, we call them crux interpretum. Although I feel like I've seen it written without this R here, but according to Google, it's supposed to be there. <laughs> Um, so I've, I've seen it interpretum, I've seen it interpretum, and I'm not sure which one is the typo, because you can find both of them online. Um, but the idea is that there's this, this crux or this crossroads of interpretation, and they're basically thorny issues that exist in all of the books of the Bible, that there's issues that we don't understand. Some of them are, are as simple as how is there light on day one when the sun isn't created till day four? Even Augustine wrestled with that one. How come we have 26 different diseases listed in uh, Leviticus, all called leprosy? Um, we know it's not Hansen's disease because it doesn't fit Hansen's disease. And it exists in houses because the light that exists in the walls of the house that's destroyed is leprosy. It's the same word. Um, I just lost it. Atsar, Tsar, 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 One of those um, is uh, sitting in the console of my car. This is one of the words I always forget, but uh, I think it's Tsar. But it, it's leprosy. But what does that mean? Um, how do you have six, or how do you have a million people leave Egypt all on the same night? Um, so, you know, some of these are just 
logic issues. Some of them are um, how do we put uh, the history of the Bible with the history from archaeology? You know, God tells um, through Ezekiel says that uh, basically Nebuchadnezzar is going to sack the city of Tyre. Well, he sacked half of it because half of it's on the mainland and half of it's on an island. But he never made it to the island. Alexander the Great made it to the island. Eventually, threw all the rubble that was left from the mainland, threw it into the sea, into the sea, made a bridge, walked across the bridge, killed everybody on the island. Um, but that's well, well after the time of, of Ezekiel and Nebuchadnezzar. So, how do we deal with that? Uh, and some of them is just it's based on perspective. Um, personally, I don't see anything in Ezekiel. I think it's thirty six or thirty eight where he talks about the. The destruction of Tyre that requires the fact that he sacked the whole thing. Seems to me it's just you're going to be invaded and a bunch of people are going to die, which is exactly what happened. Half the people died. Um, so some of them are just perspective. Same thing here of how do we put God telling Elijah to do something, but it's Elisha who does it. And again, we can come up with all sorts of theories that make us feel better, but this is one of the issues within textual criticism, not textual criticism, within textual interpretation, is just because it makes you feel better doesn't mean it's correct. Uh, in fact, as a rule of thumb, we usually go the other way. The more it makes you feel uncomfortable, the more it's probably correct. Mm -hmm. That you should go the other way towards explaining, explaining things. So I'm too comfortable with this answer, it's probably wrong. Um, because we just, we don't think that way. And there's a number of, of issues in every book that are like this. And again, some of them are just insignificant and almost to the point of silliness. Um, some of them are have to do with different manuscripts. Uh, you know, when you compare the Septuagint and some of the older Greek manuscripts to the manuscripts of First and Second Kings, you end up with different dates for some of the kings. Um, and so, you know, okay, which timeline do we use? Um, the one in the Masoretic text assumes, as I mentioned last week, that the first year of the king's reign is the year that he became the king in. So if December 31st, he becomes king, that's year one. January 1st is year two. Well, there's nothing compared to that in the ancient world. The only books that seem to do that are the Northern Kingdom. So how do you, how do you explain that? So, you know, that's another... Another famous one. So yeah, there are people that write on all of these. Sometimes they're mentioned in commentaries. Sometimes people will write papers on them, uh, trying to answer some of these questions. Uh, some of them are more famous than others. Uh, the one in Ezekiel is pretty well known. And there are a couple of other famous ones that are, are written on more than others. Some of them are really obscure, nobody cares. Uh, a lot of them I can kind of like see what the discussion is, but like this one, it just seems like it's only a problem if you're a pedant and just want to interpret everything in the most literal way mm -hmm. possible. Yeah. It seems lazy. Yes. But if, okay, so one guy probably talked to the other guy. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Yes. Just because the text didn't say that, why is that so out of the box? Or the mm -hmm. idea that the God of Israel, whether you believe he's actually real, mm -hmm. he would have communicated the same information right. to two different people. Yes. I mean, how many that. times has that happened? Yep. Or, I mean, why wouldn't the word leprosy be a colloquialism to reference just different types mm -hmm. of skin diseases? You know, mm -hmm. we're just going to use this word because that's what it was used. I mean, do they go through varieties like this? Uh, probably not. That's what's frustrating is. Mm -hmm. You guys don't do this with other books. Mm -mm. No, just here. And that, that's one of the issues. I mean, we came across one of them. It had a psalm not of who David is in 1 Samuel when he's already met David or hasn't met David or maybe he's met David. You know, that's another famous one. <laughs> but you're kind of left with, the, there isn't, you know, I think the one difference with Herodotus is when I read Herodotus and you read Herodotus mm -hmm. and you read Herodotus, and you and you and all five of us, we're all approaching it the exact same way. Herodotus is an old dead Greek guy. He wrote a book. Maybe historically reliable, maybe not. Probably is, but he may not. But we're all kind of approaching it with that same, that same perspective. 
It's just an ancient book, reliable within his perspective. So we may still disagree on the interpretation of it, but we don't really disagree on our bias of it. Whereas when we approach the Bible, I'm approaching it as the inspired word of God. You're not approaching it neutrally, though. You're, opposed, you're approaching it as it is absolutely not the word of God. So I'm approaching it of any contradiction is an apparent contradiction. Because God wrote this, God does not contradict himself. You're approaching it of God absolutely did not write this book, so I'm going to highlight every contradiction to try to prove to you that God did not write this book. So now the book is no longer being approached as an artifact. Now it's actually a weapon that we're using against each other, trying to interpret it to convince the other person. Which is why I like to take the position of, and I think what you even hinted at, Jordan, of some of these are just really dumb, and you're not going to convince the other person. You know, I had a friend who said that at dinner one day, his relatives got into a debate over how bumblebees survived the flood. And the discussion went on until one of them suggested that they had floated on debris in the water. And that made everybody happy because now they had an answer. Now they had an answer as to how it was possible. And yet there's nothing in the text that talks about bumblebees floating on pieces of debris, nor does anybody care how bumblebees survive the flood. That's, there is nobody that I've ever met that is thinking, I really wanted to become a Christian. I really wanted to put my faith in God Almighty and the death of Christ on the cross. But the one issue that is keeping me from becoming a Christian is how did the bumblebee survive the flood? Until that question is answered, I cannot become a Christian. And then when you answer, oh, I have seen the light. Now I'm going to give my life to Christ. That person doesn't exist. A person who's asking the question about bumblebees and how they survived the flood has already decided the flood doesn't happen. And I'm going to show you how stupid it is that you think the flood happened by pointing out how did bees survive the flood. But you're convincing me how bees could have survived the flood is not going to convince me to suddenly believe the Bible because that wasn't my intent. I've already decided the Bible's not true. You've already decided the Bible is true. So you say, well, Elijah just talked to Elisha. But I say, oh, this proves God didn't write the Bible. And as kind of a third party-ish, I obviously believe that God wrote the Bible. I don't feel the need to remove all the apparent contradictions in Scripture. Because I'm thinking, not only have you made the assumption that God did not write the Bible, you're also convinced that a complete idiot wrote the Bible. That he can't remember... What he wrote just a few chapters before, even though your theory suggests that not only does he remember what he wrote a few chapters before, he remembers all the way back to Deuteronomy, and he's incorporated into everything that he's written since. Except for the previous chapter, that part he skips, because he's an idiot. So you've got this guy who's a complete genius on the one hand, and in many cases they'll say, well, the redactor did it. Okay, you've got a redactor who's a genius, and who redacted everything perfectly, and yet somehow he keeps overlooking all these things, which I'm thinking, if you had an editor today who was this bad at editing, you'd get fired. Who's this bad at editing that you can't remember which seven days you're talking about a Gilgal? This isn't that hard to keep track of. There's only two. But you can't remember which one it was, and it's only been four chapters. I, I find that takes more faith. <laughs> you know, that even... Even, uh, you know, even the epic of Gilgamesh is more consistent and has fewer contradictions <laughs> than this. So, you know, well, the guy who wrote the epic of Gilgamesh was a complete literary genius, but this guy, this guy is just stupid. That seems like a much harder position to defend than even what I'm suggesting. You know, I mean, to some degree, it's the same argument that I make about creation and evolution. Of, I'm suggesting that God created it in seven days. You're suggesting that a random series of cause and effect, completely un whatever, just happened because of the sheer probability of how much time has gone on, that every possibility, given the right amount of time, will come to pass. That boom, here we are. 
And that's supposed to take less faith than an eternal God creating it in seven days. I, it's just, I'm left thinking that's ridiculous. And I kind of feel the same way about this, which in some ways means I find it fascinating when I come across apparent contradictions because I don't view them as contradictions or I view them as contradictions that the author just doesn't care about contradictions. He doesn't think it matters. Maybe both of them happened. You know, I was talking to a woman today about uh, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 20. Jesus leaves the city of Jericho, and there's two blind men. And she says, I don't think I've ever heard this story. And I said, you have, it's just not this version. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you've heard the story of blind Bartimaeus. She's like, well, I think so. It sounds a little bit more familiar. I said, well, it's the same story. But in Matthew, it's two unnamed men sitting outside Jericho, in the book of Mark, it's one man named Bartimaeus who's sitting outside Jericho, but it's the same story. But Matthew doesn't care to give the names, he tells you there's two. Mark gives you the name, but he doesn't tell you there's two. Well, secular scholars would be like, oh, see, it contradicts. Either one happens. It's so lazy. I mean, it's like, ah, uh, yep. Like, you wouldn't show that much of a lack of charity to, like, you just don't want people to tell you story about things that they have. Like, there are right. always ways to explain this if you just give it a little bit of effort and interest. Yep. Like, so many of these things, it's just like a complete lack of effort in inhabiting the world of the okay. word. Right? So. Yes. It's astonishing to me. Christian scholars will read the Bible, but their first thought is, I have to help God out. Yes. I don't, I don't understand mm -hmm. that. It's like, well, wait mm -hmm. a second. This is not about <laughs> God's not concerned with defending himself. Mm -hmm. Why on earth are you concerned about yeah. unwanted passing? Right. Yeah. And I think to some degree that's true, especially true of us as pastors and even as scholars. I mean, if, if any of you go on to eventually earn your PhDs in Old Testament or New Testament or systematic theology or anything else, and you're teaching at the academic level, and you can roll your eyes at me, but I can see you doing that. But you know, if any of you ever go on to do academia, of uh, the goal of academia from a Christian perspective should be to enable people to read their Bibles better and to love God more. It's not just to answer thorny questions. Because at the end of the day, that doesn't always help people. It may make you feel better, it may get you published, it may be a great theory, but does it really help people grow? Um, you know, that they're um, in, uh, in the chapter I was doing for this, this Sunday, in 1 Samuel 14, the last part of 1 Samuel 14 says, and Saul did valiantly in all that he did. Um, he, what's the word? He, he routed all of the enemies of God is basically, that's the Kyle version, but he routed them. And yet when you translate the word that's translated as routed, it could also mean he did wickedly. And yet every version that I look at says he routed them. There is no them. It's just he routed would be the translation. He routed or he caused them wickedness. Uh, maybe he condemned, but again, there's no object to it. And I do think it's a correct translation. He routed them, or he condemned them, or he... There are a lot of words the writer of First Samuel could have chosen. So I wonder, purely theory, I wonder how much of it is a, well, he routed them, but we all know what else this could be. You know, if it... I mean, he's just finished talking about how Saul almost killed his own son, Jonathan, because of a stupid curse that he made a stupid oath that he made in trying to manipulate God into giving them a victory over the Philistines. So Saul looks like an idiot, and then to say he did valiantly almost seems like, whoa, wait a minute, I thought we were just talking about how big of an idiot Saul is. It almost seems begrudging of, well, he won. Sort of. You know, it just kind of has that feeling to it. And I started to put that in the sermon, and then I thought, you know what, this isn't going to help anybody. This is only going to cause people to look at it and be like, well, what else does the Bible say that I can't see because I don't know Hebrew? It just, it doesn't really add to the sermon. It wouldn't add to a Bible study. It wouldn't add to 
because it's it's just a theory. I can't prove it one way or the other. You know, the only way I could prove it would be if I could find some other ancient translation in Syriac or something else that translates it negatively rather than positively. And I don't know that I don't think that manuscript exists. So it's just theory. So yeah, it's great theory. I could probably even write a paper on it and probably get it published. No, it's an interesting theory that we keep saying it's all did valiantly, maybe it's all did wickedly. I mean, that's the sort of thing that academics kind of eat up. Of, Ooh, you know, an alternative version. Yeah, I don't know that it would help anybody. And so as pastors and as teachers and as counselors, that's the question that we have to be asking ourselves is, okay, there's a level of academia of which I approach the text. There's a level of scholarship involved. I study the text and I seek to understand the text. And it's not that I'm not telling people things or hiding things from people, but I have to ask what is actually valuable spiritually to pass on to them. Perhaps I'm doing a Bible study on Leviticus. Uh, I think it's 17. No, 14 that talks about all the uh, all the, the uh, different types of leprosy and it would be helpful perhaps just to point out that they just had a general word for leprosy and that the best theory out there is that the word literally means that which flakes so if you have dandruff you have leprosy if you have psoriasis you have leprosy if you've got a flaky mold that's flaking off the walls in your house you have leprosy. That's just the general catch-all term. Okay, to enable people to read their Bible better as they read all these words about leprosy, sure, that would be valuable. Uh, to tell people that, well, the Bible says he did valiantly, but it may also just done wickedly. That might just create more ambiguity than it's worth. And the same with this of, would I necessarily mention this in a sermon? Eh, probably not. So it, it's one of those examples that's that's fun to deal with in an academic setting, like a seminary class. So, you know, ooh, how do we explain this? And that, you know, practicing of putting ourselves in the perspective of the author, but we're still left with, okay, how does this help me grow? You know, if somebody comes to you and says, I'm really struggling with believing the inspiration of scripture because there's all these apparent contradictions. Okay, sure. Let's sit down and talk about it. Somebody just says, I want to know God more. Well, let's look at 1 Kings 19. That would be a good place to start. Probably not. Uh, and so, you know, I think there is a line between being pastoral and being scholarly. And it's not that they're mutually exclusive. If anything, scholarship is the bigger category and being pastoral is the smaller category. If I'm selecting what is scholarly, and determining how that is important for my congregation and for people to grow. Um, you know, I might mention to people that the books of the Bible go in a different order in the Hebrew text. Probably not going to make a big deal out of it. Because it might concern people, of, well, what do you mean the books don't go in that order? Is my Bible wrong? Uh, I taught a Hebrew class just up the street here at uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church. <laughs> I don't know, it's probably been four years now. But uh, Pastor Boucher he said, do you know anybody who knows Hebrew? I said, well, I do. And he said, well, we had somebody that came and taught us, gave us two, two weeks, basically, of here's how the Greek New Testament works. Would you be willing to do the same for the Hebrew? I said, yeah, sure. So I came in, I gave him a rundown of Hebrew and how it works and just kind of an overview and kind of the history of some of the textual traditions and everything. And I asked if there were any questions and somebody raised their hand and he said, what percent of the English Bible is accurate? 85%. And I said, 99.9999999999999. He said, really? I said, absolutely. I said, you know, the parts that we're debating are minuscule and are very irrelevant to anything in the text. You know, in, in the Greek New Testament, I forget what the number is, there's like 10,000 debated letters, and 95% of them are the difference between we and you, which is one letter 
upside down or right side up. So which way does it go? So it's either make our joy complete or make your joy complete. Which is it? Well, one, one letter difference. Does it really affect the text? Not really. So we have complete confidence in our Bibles. If we push scholarship too much and we push theory too much, then we begin to erode the confidence that people have in their Bibles, which ends up being a huge negative because the Bible, is, even in English, is incredibly reliable. So we, we're walking that line between I want to increase people's confidence in the text, I want to increase people's understanding of how to read the text. So maybe in a class, a Sunday school class, I might deal with a particular thorny issue just to explain to people, this is why it's important to put yourself in the perspective of the writer. This is, this is how we read culturally, et cetera. But again, I'm being selective with how do I increase people's love for God, their love for their Bibles, their reliance upon their Bibles, and their growth in grace, scholarly, but not in a way that gets so bogged down in scholarship that it's irrelevant. And that's really the question that we have to ask as, as pastors, as teachers, as, as even academics, even as professors, of what information is important. And especially as I consider Old Testament and how little scholarship is done in the Old Testament on an evangelical perspective, Writing a paper on 1 Kings 19 is probably not the best use of my time. Even if it's something I'm interested in, I may have to consider what is the best use to the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, comparing the longer and shorter versions of Jeremiah in Hebrew and Greek may not be top of the list, although that one would be fun too. Um, you know, encouraging people why they need to read the genealogies throughout the Bible and why they're so important, I think that makes a difference. So, you know, even as academics, I think we have to be selective, not even just in our teaching, but where we spend our time and what it is that we invest in. Um, the goal is not just to get published, but what is it that we can do that can help people grow? which is a completely different question than secular scholars are obviously asking. And unfortunately, a completely different question than even some Christian scholars are asking. Uh, the number of Christian scholars that have gone off the deep end in the last 15 to 20 years mm -hmm. because they became more interested in publishing than they did in actually helping people is very sad. Even some very well-known, very well-respected professors that just went off the deep end. I mean, even, even Bruce Waltke, who's a very well-respected Old Testament professor, got fired from RTS Orlando, which is hard to do, but got fired from RTS Orlando because he decided that he believed in theistic evolution. And part of me is like, okay, yeah, bad idea. Why would you tell students that? Why? What, what did you think you were accomplishing? And even telling people that. You could have kept this to yourself and studied it privately until you died, which he's old, wouldn't have even been that long. But instead, you had to tell all your students and Christianity Today and everybody else that you could find that you now believe in theistic evolution. And how much of it came down to ego? I don't know. I don't know the man. But it's just not wise. Not wise at all. I mean, there are lots of things that I wonder about in Scripture but I'm not going to preach all of them. That would just be silly. That would be ridiculous to stand up in the pulpit and pass out theories. That, that's not helping anybody. And so I wonder how much of it is just people have gotten more excited in their own press than they have been in, does this information actually build the church? And that really, even as we study First and Second Kings and anything else in the Bible, that really needs to be how we're evaluating it. I'm not standing up in the pulpit giving an academic lecture. I'm not standing up in the pulpit and pontificating about how smart I am. I'm trying to preach people the word of God and edify them. And once that's forgotten, it would be better if you just went home and said nothing, which I wish some of them had done because they've done more damage in the things that they've attempted to say 
and made themselves very famous and very popular among secular scholars in the meantime. You know, oh, there's a man who's, you know, he, he really holds to his principles. He really, you know, he really holds to science. Or, you know, well, yeah, but all the damage that you've done in the meantime, certainly not worth it. Um, what's his name? Scott Oliphant. Yeah. Having to, so, I mean, at least he recanted mm -hmm. and pulled his book and mm -hmm. said, no, this is wrong. I got carried away. Yeah. But he blew up the whole seminary. He did. The entire staff. Uh -huh. And influenced a lot of students in yeah. a very dangerous way. Yeah. Because uh, he got excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I know that name. Uh, Westminster faculty, he got, was his the subordination of the sun? Or was I think so. Else? He got involved in a little bit of that ESS stuff um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then came out with his book. I can't remember the name of the book, but they pulled it since. Mm -hmm. um, and just went a bit too far being mm -hmm. new, being yeah. evolutionary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and right. Westminster prides itself on being very academic and very respected. And I think that's gotten a lot of their faculty over the years. And the whole Peter Enns controversy. Yep, that's what I was supposed to say. Peter Enns is the name. Peter Enns, Trevor Longman, a little bit. Not as much, but a little bit. Yeah. Peter Enns came out of Westminster. Yeah. 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 Yep. So there have been some really great guys. I mean, you think of um, was Van Til and Machen, were they both Westminster mm -hmm. originally? Yeah. And then yep. just like and, you can't uh, you can't go to Westminster and want to be the next Machen. Mm -hmm. And your purpose is to go be the next Van Til. That's and guys have messed up the church trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in a, in a lot of ways, I, you've got that T-shirt from Count Zinzendorf. Oh yeah. And a, the the I can't it's remember now the balls and arrows. <laughs> yeah, the the no, I can't remember. I just remember the last part of it. Be forgotten. But I can't remember the first part. <laughs> um, what is it? Preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. Yeah, preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. <laughs> and, Dr. Gold. Yeah. I mean, that's really, you know, there are only a handful of people that anybody's going to remember. And if you give it long enough, nobody's even going to remember them. So, I mean, you know, most of what we hold to in terms of covenant theology was put together by Ursinus and uh, the other guy whose name I can't remember pronounced Osamum. Os Lumpadius. Yeah, there you go. That guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are very few people aside from the odd, uh, you know, Presbyterian who even knows those names and really can't tell you a whole lot about them. Um, you know, uh, it just, you know, Occam is known for Occam's razor, but he was a theologian, but nobody remembers that. So, you know, I, you, you're going to be forgotten. So you might as well just get used to the idea of you're going to be forgotten. And all the books that you write, Gonna, it's significant. And so really what you have to show for it is the difference that you made in people's lives. That's really what it comes down to. And yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that I, I really like about Bright. In fact, that might be one of my favorite things about Bright is that if you teach it right, you don't have a big ego. You can't. It's not, this is not a place for big egos because we're just not that big. And I like that. You know, we're just influencing a few people at a time. I like, I like that model of we write. I mean, Tim Decker's been published in several journals. And you know, who knows? Maybe he'll be one of the most famous New Testament professors ever. But I can also see him being super famous and still teaching at Bright. Uh, and I, you know, I think that's the way it should be. Of, you know, when I was at Trinity, and Trinity is very big on Trinity, um, they realized that they had so convinced their students that Trinity is so wonderful that none of their students would take small churches. Wow. And since that's the seminary for the Evangelical Free Church, all these small Evangelical Free Churches couldn't hire Trinity grads because the Trinity grad wouldn't go there, wouldn't take it. 
And they, as a staff, recognized that that was a problem, and so they started shifting their culture as an academic institution to, we gotta stop telling people that because they went to Trinity, they're amazing. <coughs> but I mean, there's still circles that I walk into today, and they're like, where'd you go to school? Oh, I went to Trinity. Oh, oh you went to Trinity. And I wanna be like, it was close. And I was one of like 3,000 people. So it's it's not as amazing as it seems. But, you know, oh, it's you know, went to Trinity. Yeah, I saw them in the hallway once. You know, it just, it, it sounds impressive, but there are people who are honestly convinced why I went to Trinity. So, hey, I'm, I'm awesome. And I feel sorry for those people. But there are a lot of people. It's just no self Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Really awful. Yes. Yeah, because the little old lady who's giving you a hard time in your office doesn't really care where you went to seminary. <laughs> she doesn't care at all. She doesn't care at all. She wants to know why you changed the flowers out front without telling her. <laughs> yeah. Not that that would ever happen in nature. <laughs> Never happened here. Yeah. All right, well, I'll get off my soapbox now. That's <laughs> good. So uh, I'll post the exam tonight. Uh, basically what I did, and I, I posted a new copy of the possible questions on the website, and I highlighted in yellow the question. I think I added one question. Actually, I noticed there was a question on there that was on there twice, so I took it out the second time and put in a new question. But I highlighted it in yellow so that you can see that it's a second question, a new question. And then, uh, so on the exam, uh, I basically realized that there are, I think, 24 questions that I gave you, and they break down into um, background, Joshua Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. And there's about six questions in each one. So I'm, give, I divided them up into groups of six, and then I'm asking you to do two from each one. So that's basically the exam, is write two questions. They're, they're not full-on essays. You know, you don't have to write 50 pages on each one. They're not short answer either. So answer the question as thoroughly as you can in whatever space it takes you. So uh, it's not, I'm, I'm not really big on assigning a number of sentences because then students kind of fluff it to make that many sentences. <laughs> so answer the question. <laughs> That's all I can either answer to you did. So yeah. Do you have a question? Yes. There's two different dates on here for when it's due. Oh. When is it due? <laughs> it says it says due class 10 and then the next posting says due next week. Oh it's so, due next week. Okay. Yes. My bad. Okay. Thank you for catching that. Yes, it is due next next week because the uh, the rough draft will be due the week you get back from April eighth. Yeah, we will not have class on April first. Yeah. So yeah, that's a. Uh, typo on my part. Um, you can type it out and then um, yeah, you can oh, just hit it. Uh, you can um, you can type it and then there is a place on uh, under class nine where it says do midterm where you can submit it. And I think I responded to all your papers. So, or to reading those, gave some thoughts. But it was all look good. So, yeah. So the test is due next Thursday. Um, in class, we'll do Chronicles, but Chronicles will not be on the exam, it'll be on the final exam. And then, um, so although. In a lot of ways, the, uh, the, the last few uh, books that we'll cover are nowhere in as much in depth as the earlier books in terms of theology. I, I almost 
think that if I had to do class over again, I'd spend more time in First and Second Samuel and Judges and less time in Kings and the rest of them. But so we've, I feel like we've kind of covered some of the meat of the class in some ways. Um, but we'll still we'll still cover each of the rest of the books. I don't want to give them short shrift, but I do feel like the deepest book we've covered has been First and Second Samuel. Maybe that's because I'm preaching through it and I'm just biased. <laughs> yeah, I wish we could spend more time. But yeah, and then uh, rough draft will be due the that you're taking back. So, do you have any questions on any of that? Let me know. Uh, and I, I don't know if I, I think it's listed in the syllabus, but do you use Turabian or Chicago sometimes is a close comparison to Turabian? Uh, basically, what I'm looking for is just footnotes and not, not endnotes and not in text citation. So, because in text citation, you can do, um, if you want to do scripture references in text, that's fine. Um, but not, you don't need to cite the source in, in the text, you can just footnote that. Uh, but if you want to do biblical citations in the text, that's fine. Uh, but then put the footnote at the bottom of the page that it's on, rather than it and notes. And we're just, just monthly. I hate when I read a book and it would be a notes in the back of the book. It just makes me want to give the book. Or an MLS and you get through the entire citation. Yes, that too. <laughs> that too. That's what I that's what we did in high school. We did MLS. Pretty standard for like English. Yes. Nice. Yep. I yeah. learned that pretty well, so I've, I've never done anything to it again. But oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's, very yeah. it's very stream. It's like a streamlined version of MLS because everything shows up in a footnote. Oh, footnotes. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> but there. They're nice because well, here's a little side note. That you yes, you can you can put stuff. It's almost like having an appendices, but it's yeah, in the yeah. I Sanders is theology. He puts humor into this, but that's all. Yeah. 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 I think Dr. Rankin said once you can you can read a book and that's good. You can read a book. And the footnotes, and that's better. And I forget what it is. You can read a book, read the footnotes, and there's some third thing, read reviews or something. That's the best, or something along those lines. And I remember thinking, when I took systematic theology, I skipped all the footnotes. <laughs> I don't think I read any of them, <coughs> unless I was interested in the topic. Uh, but yeah, I like them because you can put in all sorts of asides. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. Although I have some some pages of my dissertation that he'll have like four sentences on the paper and the rest is all footnotes. <laughs> yeah. And Midwestern decided that it would be cool to have their own style guide, so they went through and changed all sorts of stuff in Turabian. So usually Turabian has a ten point font for the footnote, and twelve point for the text. Midwestern wants 12 point for everything, right. which just makes all the pages bigger. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, yeah, that's crazy. Just don't. And instead of tabs, you use five spaces. So I wrote a paper oh, once. Uh, it, the tab and the five spaces oh, actually eight spaces. is pretty different. But I wrote a paper and I, Turned the paper in, and the professor circled the indent and said, "Your spaces are off." I put four, and he, he looked at it himself, like, "You need to get a new job. This is a little bad." Yeah, but even even uh, like the one professor, one of my readers, he wrote back and he said, uh, "You need to <coughs> you need to check the um, the style guide." 
to find out if the scholar's name ends in S, do you just put apostrophe or apostrophe S? And I'm thinking, I'm a PhD student, does it really matter? I mean, really? Which is crazy, because once you, once you start publishing, you just send it off the editor and they do whatever the heck they want with it. So nobody worries about style guides once they, right. once they start publishing. This is what happens when you go to a oh. seminary that's Baptist and then a book can break. That's it. That's it. You have to send her a note if not to drink. <laughs> well, uh, at Midwestern you can drink. They need to drink more though. <laughs> they're obviously yeah, they're not, most of them are, are pretty old school Baptists, so most of them don't. But it, I think it's Southern, Southeastern, and several of the other ones you actually have to sign something now that says you can't. Yeah, Southern you definitely do. Doesn't seem very Protestant. But. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I actually had uh, one of my professors at the um, when we were at during uh, 